We might get started. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon uh, as part of the opening weekend of APT8. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Jose de Silva. I'm the head of the Cinematheque here. Um, and we have the great uh, pleasure today um, to talk with my dear friend, Yassan Banal. Uh, unfortunately, Kiri, who uh, was supposed to be part of this panel, uh, cannot be here. Um, due to some unforeseen travel restrictions associated with the APEC summit in Manila. Um, she wasn't able to fly here in time for today, which is a real shame. Um, but I do urge you to see her work that's in Gallery 1.1, her photographs, and then some of her uh, video and film work will, uh, will be screened as part of uh, Filipino Indie uh, later in the program. So Yasson, for those of you who don't know, is uh, an extraordinary artist. He works with installation, uh, performance, text, uh, curating, uh, and pedagogy uh, as part of this practice. Uh, his work has been seen at the Tate Modern, the Singapore Biennial, the Shanghai Biennial, uh, the Queen's Museum of Art, and very frequently at the Cultural Center um, in the Philippines. Uh, in addition to his uh, studio work, he also teaches film theory and film studies at the University of the Philippines Film Institute. Yasin and I have been working uh, very closely uh, on a project for APT. It's one of three projects uh, called Filipino Indie, and it's part of, a, I guess, a, 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 a broader uh, focus on the Philippines as part of this APT 8. Uh, exhibition and this program is essentially put forward as a survey of uh, of independent and experimental filmmaking from the Philippines from uh, the early 2000s uh, onwards um, and something that was interesting that we had both talked about quite a lot was uh, the idea of uh, uh, documentary or, or an artistic turn towards experimenting with the idea of documentary realism and inherently then uh, making kind of hybrid forms of fiction and uh, documentary. Uh, this isn't something that is unique to uh, the Philippines, but uh, there was something, well, certainly from my perspective in terms of being interested in this, um, this national cinema, uh, and a an approach that uh, came about with the rise of uh, digital filmmaking in the early 2000s, uh, a certain kind of um, uh, sensitivity and um, sensibility, as it were, uh, that, that you could see in this national cinema with artists and filmmakers uh, at all stages of their career uh, resisting those kind of dominant models of uh, montage and finding new vocabularies for storytelling uh, through the use of um, digital filmmaking. Um, I wanted to work with Yasson not only because he's a great artist uh, and a great thinker, um, but because I, in some ways I think he has a very keen understanding of, of contemporary visual culture in the Philippines. And, um, and in his work as an artist, he's able to kind of manifest uh, the research component that underpins his work uh, as part of the visual language of his work. Uh, and also, you know, for me, it's much more interesting uh, to work with an artist than with another curator. And uh, so it was really a pleasure for him to, uh, to come on board uh, and to bring uh, a, a different kind of thinking around um, how you might uh, uh, put together a, a screening program and a series of discussions um, about this um, film, very specific kind of film history. Uh, the one thing that I was also very keen for Yasson to do was to also approach the project without writing a kind of standard curatorial essay that you might see accompanying a program. And instead he made uh, a video which in some ways functions as like an experimental curatorial essay for screen. Uh, and that work is showing out in the foyer of the cinema. Uh, it's a work that's called uh, An Untitled Episode. And I think because you're here and we have limited time today, it seems appropriate that we should focus in some part on that work. Um, and I'm keen, you know, it'd be great to hear from you in terms of how you approached um, making that work and how you approached the idea of creating a kind of visual essay. Because it is very dense and I think it's kind of worth unpacking a little bit. Um, 
Yeah, thanks, um, Jose, and hi, everyone. Um, yeah, the, as you mentioned, um, I thought it would just be interesting to do a, a, a video essay instead of the standard curatorial text. So um, with the Filipino India as a framework uh, and social realism as, a, as a, I guess, a dominant canon in not just in Philippine cinema, but also in visual arts, um, as we were uh, talking through the course of the preparation for the show, um, I thought it would be interesting to also explore uh, contemporary manifestations of the document. So um, I call it episodes because, yeah, there are certain uh, segments um, to it. So I was really interested in kind of an internet culture, but coming from the Philippines where we have the slowest <laughs> Wi-Fi, <laughs> I think. Um, I thought it was really interesting to explore the notion of the real in a very slow search engine. Um, and I think that's kind of an interesting uh, springboard for the notion of the document and abstraction. So um, I was exploring that. That's what, and then um, uh, there, there are basically four segments in the video. The first one is uh, basically a, a superstar actor from the Philippines who uh, uh, reenacted uh, Pinoy Big Brother. So I transcribed the Pinoy Big Brother um, series in the Philippines, just the first episode. So I, I wanted to explore that notion again of the document, but how it's also, again, being fictionalized in contemporary televisual culture. So I asked this very famous actor to, to restage it, to read uh, the text. Um, and uh, I also used uh, two chroma paintings. So, I, I, um, so for me, uh, again, using the, the notion of the abstract, with this green and blue paintings, but with uh, Kino flow lights and risers via the, uh, uh, a group show in a museum, they become charged with uh, a theatrical or cinematic aspect to this abstract painting. So these abstract paintings actually become templates for new chromas, for new documents to come in. So I thought that was, again, um, uh, so on one hand, you have the document as the real and the abstract that is not supposedly non-representational. So I exhibited these two paintings that get uh, that moonlight as chroma screens on weekends where I do these shoots. And uh, another episode uh, was conversations with filmmakers. So um, I had conversations with uh, John Torres, uh, really good um, experimental filmmaker who works on the notion of the video diary. And then Roxley, uh, our pioneering sorry, uh, like uh, punk filmmaker. And then Poklong Anading, uh, a visual artist who also works on video. And Gary Pastrana, Koke Lumbao. So that's the second uh, episode. Um, and I thought it would be interesting, again, to just remove the face and the sound and subtitle everything via color codes. So again, abstraction and just pure color. And then you get in a way, a collage of just all these um, transcriptions of the conversation. And Do you want to yeah. talk a little bit about what those conversations um, were? Yeah, um, Gary, Pas well, first was Gary Pastrana, whose video we're showing, 99%. Uh, uh, it's a very interesting conceptual artist that uses video, uh, at least in the conversation also. He, he's mentioned that as a document, um, uh, documentation of a process. So in this work, 99%, he, uh, he destroyed a car uh, and made the, and sold the 99% of the car and the remaining 1% used it to buy a 24 karat gold. So it's kind of interesting, again, notion of value and materiality. And he documented that, uh, that process. And uh, Poklong Anading, Ronald Anading, he, uh, we're showing his, um, art, art death, which is, uh, I think, an interesting take on uh, documentary and also cinema because he collaborated with production designers in Manila. So a lot of artists, visual artists, we have to moonlight sometimes, you know, some teach, like anywhere. Um, and visual artists like Gary and Poklong also did production design work. So his video Art Death was a collaboration with his uh, production designer colleagues and um, 
turned into these sort of outtakes of their film production into a music video. And then uh, John Torres and Shireen, I had a conversation because they're a couple, they're a brilliant fil uh, filmmaking couple. And uh, yeah, so it's interesting because they were at the same space, the same time, but the conversation happened in sequence. But when they talk, when I transcribed the, the conversation, I realized like they were really meant for each other. I mean, what they were talking about, their relationship to cinema and memory is so, just jive, you know, jiving together and, um, and uh, how they're practiced also as filmmakers, which I think is important in the Philippines, is that because we don't have much uh, state support or the market now is at least, you know, kind of happening. But a lot of uh, artists have always done um, initiatives, you know, DIY. And uh, John and Shireen have, has done that. Uh, Gary also, they put up a space before. So I think there was part of that, that filmmaking is not just about film production, but a kind of a generosity in terms of other practices or um, engaging other artists because there's no other spaces to do that. And then uh, Roxley um, uh, mentioned films that he liked, you know, so films like films of Kidla Tahimik and Love Diaz, which are also part of our program. And then last is Manny Montelibano, who's uh, the art one of the artists that, uh, who represented the Philippines in the Venice Biennial. So he made this video that we're also including here called uh, A Dash Tate. It's a three channel uh, video, but in this case for the single screen, uh, that talks about, at least explores the, the state of the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so all these conversations were transcribed. And also finally, sorry, uh, Koko Lumbao, who also deals with, um, and I asked him about uh, his relationship with, with cinema or the moving image. <clears throat> sorry, in his practice, it's really uh, cl more uh, closer to painting than, than documentary. Uh, but when you see his videos, it seems like observational document. But when you do read what he's saying, it does make sense how it's relation to to the uh, to uh, painting and time. So he sees his practice in that way. Um, then, um, yeah, the third episode is the where I did a uh, a journey um, uh, from Cubao. Cubao is the because Manila has these old amazing theaters in the forties, uh, uh, which are like Art Deco buildings that I think also in other places that are just ravaged and um, turned into soft porn cinema, uh, soft porn theaters. So this, this sort of old glory of the uh, majestic uh, cinema has, has, has faded. Um, and so I did the walk from Cubao, which is one part of the city, to the Manila Film Center, which was Imelda Marcos's kind of uh, gift, supposedly, to the country. Uh, but um, so yeah, so I I, we, I just did a, a walk with uh, two uh, two assistants, and I did the I had a blue chroma garment, and we just made this kind of phantom walking through the different theaters that are gone now, or at least not in that um, state. Like the Manila Film Center now is a place for it's a Korean-owned drag theater, so it's still interesting. Um, and then the, the old Art Deco theaters, yeah, showed that um, uh, uh, this, you know, like uh, pornographic films, which I think is interesting. So I chromed in the last part of uh, a, a talk that I did at the Museum of Contemporary Art and Design as part of a group show. I, uh, I just chromed the, the, the documentaries, uh, police documentaries in the Philippines that kind of barge in on these supposedly illegal activities inside the theaters. So I thought, again, interesting how cinema and uh, crime, or cinema and real life. Uh, so on one hand, a lot of Philippine cinema seem to deal with social realist issues, but I want to go to the notion of the document in these television shows, you know, from, and they're as, as fabricated and as sensational as any uh, like feature film. So if I th yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting like to Juxtapose. The, the immediate thing that I thought about when I saw the video the first time was the kind of 
like the w the sort of weight of visual history that artists carry with them. And it's interesting that you you literally use your body as a kind of um, as a sort of a site for a digital insert, mm -hmm. and then you you kind of um, you kind of play into that space a whole range of clips from um, from you know the classics yeah. of, of of Philippine cinema. And this, this is a bit of a stretch to something else, but I, one of the things that I think we talked about a lot throughout the process was these sort of almost two sides to um, how people understand in, in uh, the English-speaking world um, contemporary Filipino cinema. On one hand, you have, um, you have uh, this kind of strong tradition of social realism, of activist um, film and documentary, uh, and there's a lot of it in the program. Uh, and then you have the kind of... Um, experimentation of people like John Tors or you know the kind of extreme use of duration in Lav Diaz's work so you have this in one side and then on the other side you have this kind of um, something that's been often referred to as kind of poverty porn or mm -hmm. the Brilliante Mendoza kind of films which uh, get wide distribution in festivals and um, and kind of revel in this kind of third world cinema yeah. um, and I, I, I wonder you know, if you could talk a little bit about, I think, you know, how young artists and filmmakers uh, see their own work in relation to perhaps the way that their work is um, framed in an international context. Yeah, that's a very good question, because um, just last week before I came here, there was this uh, Cinema One Film Festival. So on the on a positive note, there's... Um, uh, seems to be a lot more uh, opportunities from distribution wise to to grants for filmmakers um, uh, that said it's uh, always tricky when uh, filmmakers need to I guess they have to situate themselves in how these films are being framed um, the good thing is that there's a stronger film culture now I mean love Diaz for one the next film uh, the, the film that we're showing after this um, was quite emotional uh, for, for him. It, it was, uh, never would you see a theater that was packed. And people were in wheelchairs. And he was in Locarno and doing a li kind of live feed. And it was really emotional because it was, um, it wasn't so much just the buzz. It was really a film culture taking a stand on what, what they want to see. Um, and another film that is, garner, you know, kind of an interesting effect of, of framing is General Luna. Uh, it created a lot of uh, buzz, both good and bad. But as we were talking earlier, also like uh, it 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 generated um, uh, a public uh, that film was supposed to be closed after three days, but because of social media, just recommendations from friends, it turned out to be the highest grossing film now. So in that case, um, filmmakers situate this as a good poverty porn with Lino Broca and the Golden Age, but also going back to not just uh, a kind of a simplistic understanding of independent, because independent now is so tricky. It's just mm -hmm. also a marketing tool used by the studios because it's cheaper actually. So digital doesn't necessarily mean independent. So I, I'm happy that filmmakers are, are um, on one hand, um, have to kind of uh, negotiate with the funding, but at the same time, still, uh, you know, being true to their vision. And you have filmmakers like John and Raya and Khan and Love, but there's also a, a, a big group of um, I guess it also happens in Biennale circuits, you know, like uh, uh, how how the local or how identity is framed in an international scale. So uh, again, for me, like that's why the the like someone like Nick de Ocampo would frame cinema as not even independent because there's so many permutations that have proven that even studio-based system have created an independent sensibility rather than just using independent as a mode of production. So uh, filmmakers on one hand need to, uh, are exploring those different modes of production. Um, I think the, the strat, yeah, the kind of a, the critical strategy 
of how one positions himself after having gone through that production process and funding. It's, that's what for me is important also. Um, how they really kind of create an agency for themselves while they get the money and funding to be able to f yeah, have that um, uh, freedom to also how these works are framed. Mm. Mm. W but let's maybe talk a little bit about LAV because one of the other components for um, the cinema program is a, is a retrospective of LAV Diaz. Uh, this is the first time his work has been seen in this um, in this extent in Australia, um, and it's a big undertaking. I th there are 13 works, uh, close to about 70 hours of uh, on-screen time, which is a bit of a, a hard thing to muscle into an exhibition, but we've um, programmed it throughout the exhibition and with a hope that uh, people will, there's enough breathing space between works. And uh, this, this afternoon, we're going to show uh, one of his latest films, um, which is called From What Is Before, from 2014. Um, for those of you who don't know Lav, uh, he's often referred to as the ideological father of, uh, of the new Philippine cinema uh, and known specifically for his kind of, um, uh, his use of, of, of duration or of extreme duration, four to 12 hours being the average length of his films. Uh, Lav always argues that Filipinos are governed by the concept of space and nature rather than uh, time, and that his slow aesthetic, which you know permeates throughout all of his films, uh, is reflective of of this. The film today uh, imagines life in a remote coastal town uh, in just the years before uh, Marcos, the Marcos Declaration of Martial Law, um, and it's a really very haunting. Um, betrayal of life in uh, very uncertain um, times. Uh, and uh, won uh, uh, the Golden Leopard, actually, um, at Locarno. Um, how, is, how is Lav's work received locally? I mean, you talked about mm -hmm. this emotional feeling he had of mm -hmm. seeing a cinema full, uh, full of mm -hmm. people. But, you know, his, his work, I mean, it, it, you know, it's kind of like celebrated in an, in an international um, yes. scene, but how is it thought of back home? I think it took a while. It took a while. Uh, that's why the 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 reception um, prior, uh, r just right after the Locarno triumph, was overwhelming. Whether it was just basing it from an, again an international criterion, but I remember when our common friend, uh, this dear film critic Alexis Joseco who was murdered uh, in 2009, was really important in the in <laughs> Philippine New Wave. Um, Alexis would be organizing free film screenings of love, and we will just be like five people, six people. And again, it's like that, with no money, we just organize, or Alexis would organize, and he, would, he championed love and all the, you know, these uh, emerging filmmakers. So it's bittersweet that uh, Alexis is not around, but of course he would have been, because uh, he made this amazing letter to cinema, which has become the template for a lot of young film critics. And one of those films, uh, one of his wishes for cinema is again, you know, like for, for Lab's work to be more received. And I think that's one down and a lot more to go. But um, yeah, no, Lab now is getting out of the, it's amazing, like Norte uh, was shown uh, in malls. Yeah, mm. um, outside of the usual repertory or outside of our, the university. So that, you know, in that aspect, it's so um, energizing, you know, when, when you see pub the public making choices of, you know, between 12 Hollywood films in the mall and one five-hour film, <laughs> what did you choose, you know? Mm. But they, they opted to, to do that, so it's getting a lot of um, viewership. I love how he says that the digital can bring down governments, um, yeah. and in a sense, I think the the widespread um, acceptance and approval of his work by by a local audience um, is testimony to that. If we don't have any um, questions, we might. Um, are we do? Yes. Is that George? Yeah. yeah hi. <laughs> hi. Um, thanks so much for talking about the context and giving a sense. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about, um, you kind of alluded to the emergence of uh, other types of distribution circuit and the emergence of a market and the kind of art market. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit 
because we've heard you know about the distribution sector, the relationship to different types of cinema. But I wonder if you could talk about the art sector in the Philippines mm -hmm. as well and how, whether there's also opportunities that have emerged in that mm -hmm. field for artists to work and also to work in between these sectors and how that's been kind of navigated by your own work and mm -hmm. other filmmakers you're mm -hmm. talking about. Uh, no, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I think with artist run spaces, that's where it's at. And uh, I think that's what happens also in other places. So. Uh, so first artist-run spaces has always been like that. So um, from the 90s, I mean from the 60s, our teachers in uh, like Chabet, uh, very influential, um, Kidlat Tahimik in Baguio, just self-organized spaces. And then uh, on a, on a, uh, in an institutional level, it's also catching up. Uh, we have the Cultural Center of the Philippines, uh, the University of the Philippines, and also other university museums. And uh, in terms of the art market, galleries are showing uh, video artists part of their like really stable of artists and roasters. Uh, the 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 student um, sector is very active. Um, there's a lot of, uh, of film festivals that's also regional. Um, I think that's great that uh, there's um, a body that was formed just a few years ago called the FDCP, which is under the office of the government, which um, because that's always been our problem, archiving. And um, it's, I mean, it's late, better late than ever, but I remember when I, yeah, it's, I think that's distribution. Archiving is so important to distribution. And our films are lost. Uh, Nick Deocampo has actually focused, which I think is great, on, on archiving in, in, in Philippine, history, uh, Philippine cinema history in the Spanish and American occupation. Uh, but even the digital uh, realm, we just had this conversation with uh, John, with a bunch of Japanese filmmakers last month, and with Raya and everyone. And still, with digital, it's still hard to archive for some reason. So um, it's just also maybe I guess artists sometimes don't tend to save, or just I don't know, forget distribution. So we still need a lot of help in that. I mean. We don't have distributors at all. So even these independent film festivals, they own the they own the copyright. So even a filmmaker like Shireen, when we were, you know, like the screening fee goes to, of course, legally, you know, technically that's fine. But um, I hope you know that there's more distribution um, ways to yeah to show these films uh, outside of the film production circuit, but galleries. I think as, uh, in that way, I think the art sphere could help because um, it's a very different distribution process when, when it's treated as a video piece, as an artist's work, rather than as a film film. It's a totally different kind of mechanism of how a film gets distributed. So it would be great for an artist space to just really focus, uh, like anthology film archives, I guess, or like locks. But we don't have, yeah, I think that would be great. We were just talking before about uh, doing some digitization and, and, and transferring some materials into DCPs for this project and then being able to send them back with Yasson uh, to Manila uh, because it, it has been uh, um, a difficult process mm -hmm. to find formats and yeah. to um, um, have things presented in, a, in the way that they need to be presented in you know, 2015. <laughs> I think that um, brings us up. Oh, sorry, yes, Hendrik. When we met a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> uh, we um, we started talking about the work that you showed at the um, um, Museum of uh, Contemporary Art and Design, and that you also showed in your uh, own space, where you indeed sort of, sort of transcribed the script from uh, the Big Brother uh, episodes and used that to you know sort of reenact that sort of form of scripted re reality in a way. And I was wondering, I mean, with that opens up so many. Uh, questions indeed sort of uh, about the document and the real and sort of how fiction speaks to both in a way. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit more how your work but also how your sort of conversation relates to the medium of uh, TV in that sense and, and how that plays a role in your work or not. Um, there's, uh, actually like um, I was so excited just coming here because I spent the most of my time just watching TV in the apartment. No, seriously, um, because I, 
Um, not that there's any kind of like righteous reason for, for not watching TV, but I stopped watching TV in 2000. But that said, I, because I think it's just so many channels. But what I'm interested, I think, in this particular, which is not, an, not a new phenomenon at all, but reality TV, um, and I guess how it filters through uh, Philippine um, kind of, uh, yeah, uh, visual culture. And, um, and Pinoy Big Brother uh, is, yeah, it's basically a springboard for all these, uh, for, for these actors. That's how they start. So it's, it's kind of interesting in how they perform reality in that sense, that the kind of efficacy of being a fictional star is how you play being real well on TV. So, um, and using the reality transcript and being restaged by uh, this uh, actor. And I had another, because uh, it's a work in progress, a, a Japanese guy reading the text in, in Filipino. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of interested more in the, 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 the fascination or the revenge or the obsession with the real now. Um, and I think that's also part of the rise of abstraction and, and or new forms of documentary and, and abstraction. And I think TV via the reality, uh, TV phenomenon. Um, I mean, I don't have a, anything conclusive, but I, yeah, it's just something that interests me in relation to modes of representation. Thank you, Yasson. It's been such um, a real treat. <laughs> thank you. Um, and thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Uh, please pick up the cinema brochure or you can look online. Uh, the Filipino Indie Program has about 35 features, but then another 30 or 40 shorts in it. So it's quite an expansive program. And, um, and yeah, for those who have a bit of patience. Um, <laughs> watch uh, it, please. Watch, 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 watch it. The, the Lab DS film will, yeah. will um, commence shortly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.